What is going on guys? Welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video. And in today's Kerbal Space Program video, we're going to be recreating uh, one of my favorite craft from real life, and that is the X-15 hypersonic rocket plane, uh, which was a program in the 1950s, and it's pretty cool. And I would like, and so I thought I would just recreate it in Kerbal Space Program. Now you might be wondering, Matt, you plundering pilotier, that doesn't look like a very quick aircraft at all. In fact, it looks rather sluggish. And you'd be correct there, random viewer, because this itself is not the X-15. I mean, I'm guessing most of you probably like this sort of thing and are probably aware of the X-15's existence, but I'm going to just pretend that you don't for the sake of this joke. This is not the X-15. It is, in fact, the launch platform for the X-15. You see, the X-15... I've said the, X, the word X-15 quite a lot in that sentence. The X-15 didn't have the Delta V required to get from the ground up to maximum speed and maximum altitude. The engine itself, the uh, XLR-99 rocket engine that was used on all but two of the launches, uh, would only burn for about two minutes before running out of fuel. So the idea was that it would be launched from the air from the wing of a modified B-52 bomber. And that is what I'm building. And that was a very roundabout way of saying I'm going to start by building a B-52 bomber recreation because that was the launch platform. But you know me, this video did actually end up turning out quite long, actually. It's like 20 minutes and I, I didn't think it would come out this long, but I guess we have to show lots of different aspects of the flight. And I do like showing off the builds. The build does take a fair chunk of the video, but people do say that they like watching the build, so I keep them in. I don't know why I'm drawing attention to this. <laughs> and I th But to be honest, I think this uh, aircraft does include some interesting uh, building methods that I'm showing you here. The engines of the B-52 were quite interesting, well, are quite interesting, in that it's, like, it's not like 747 engines, for example, where it's just a big jet engine. There's like two of them on each wing. It was actually four jet engines on each wing, but there were like two clusters of two, so I guess not two clusters, two pairs of engines per wing. So this can be quite a hard shape to do in Kerbal Space Program, but the way I do it is by building it once, use the symmetry, and then take that cluster and then place it as symmetry again. Does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense because I'm terrible at explaining things generally, I hope what you saw on screen did an adequate job or is doing an adequate job of what I'm trying to explain to you. Anyway, that's a that's an interesting little quirk of how to build this thing that the uh, building time lapse has enabled the showcasing of. Let's move on from this now. <laughs> Like, I mean, <clears throat> to be honest, this B-52 recreation is serviceable, I think, for the purposes of this video. But it's not. Like, it is a bit rough around the edges, to be honest. I've had a bit of a busy week this week. You may be aware of the copyright things I've been going through, so I didn't have that much time to dedicate to a Kerbal Space Program video. So I, 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 had to, I had to leave the aircraft kind of a bit rough around the edges. But there are some amazing B-52s on the Steam Workshop. I would just recommend downloading one of those rather than downloading the craft file from this video because they are just better than the one I built. But, you know, I, it was quite fun to build nonetheless. And I think it, I think I did an all right job in sort of capturing the general essence of what a B-52 looks like. And besides, it's not meant to be the main focus of this video. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm placing the, uh, the weak jet engines. But the ones that, well, I should say the weak jet engines, but are kind of uh, replica appropriate for this aircraft, but they're just not powerful enough to get this thing up to a satisfactory altitude. So I ended up switching them out for the whiplash engines, which I think are meant to be uh, analogous to the SR-71's engine. So uh, very uh, overpowered and not appropriate for this aircraft, but I just don't burn them like to full throttle. So I can just, you know, keep this thing at a realistic speed, but also actually get it to a usable altitude. One alternative that a lot of other builders have found to this is just by clipping lots of Wheezy engines, that's what the name of these engines I'm using here at the moment are called, just clipping lots of them together, but I don't know, I want to try and keep things uh, not too glitchy, so I ended up just switching them all out for whiplash engines. And here we are, just see me, I, I expanded the wingspan a little bit here just so that the actual peripheral landing gear at the edges of the wings could reach the ground. And also to kind of give this thing a slightly more realistic scale because the wings of the B-52 are very big. It did, however, mess up some of the symmetry. I think it's because I kind of did some exploitative symmetry use when constructing those engine clusters. Uh, so when you tried offsetting, the game didn't really know what to do with them and it just kind of messed up some of the symmetry. So I deleted a couple of the uh, parts that were only really there to kind of make the structure look more complete, which is still probably not a great reason to delete them. But even so, I have moved on in the uh, construction. So let's just move on with this commentary. 
I said earlier that, you know, the weaker jet engines couldn't get this thing up to a very usable altitude because the B-52 had to get up pretty high. The X-15 was a research aircraft and it was designed into looking at what would happen as a craft passed through the hypersonic barrier. To get to such a speed, the atmosphere had to be pretty thin in order to provide as, least, as low resistance as possible. By the way, we've now cross-faded to the construction of the X-15 that I'm now actually starting to talk about in the commentaries. This was pretty good timing. To kind of give you a sense of what technology was like at the time, previously the fastest planes that had ever flown was merely supersonic, or you know, Mach 1.2. Hypersonic is at minimum five times the speed of sound, Mach 5 to Mach 10. The X-15 ran a series of experimental flights looking at different kinds of things, but the main two variants of the missions were ones that either focused on just raw speed, while the other mission type looked into gaining as much altitude as possible. Now, the former mission profile culminated in a legendary flight by pilot William J. Knight, who reached a speed of Mach 6.7 at 31 kilometers high, which is about 4,520 miles an hour. And this actually remains the fastest speed ever recorded by a manned powered aircraft. That's right. Yeah, this this thing made the SR seventy one look like uh, some kind of ox cart. Hey, hey, wait a wait a second. Okay, brilliant jokes aside, yes, this thing definitely outpaced the SR seventy one by quite a massive margin. Obviously, the advantage of the SR seventy one was that it was actually usable for long distances and could get itself and could actually power itself all the way along its journey. It didn't need a kind of launch platform to get going. But I do love a good underdog story, and the X fifteen. I don't know, there's just something really cool about it. Um, you can see me trying to recreate the shape of it here. It's not a perfect shape recreation because I guess it's quite hard to replicate these sorts of things with KSP's rudimentary parts. I've got those uh, intake vents there. They're not actually there to power the engine or, or to supply oxygen to the engine, I should say, because uh, the engine is a rocket engine. But they're there to kind of, you know, help chair, sort of make the shape of this craft a bit more faithful to the original. Those big sort of fat tail fins as well are actually supposed to be more wedge shaped as well to help keep the thing stable during hypersonic flight. Uh, wedge shapes are also quite hard to replicate in Kerbal Space Program. What you may notice that's quite interesting about the design of this thing is that whilst we've got landing gear at the front, we don't have any landing gear at the back. We've instead got landing skis, which we can build thanks to the Breaking Ground DLC with the rocket with the with the rocket parts with the hinge pieces. But you might notice that they don't actually extend beyond the actual height of the uh, the lower wedge fin tail fin, whatever it is called. Oh my god. They don't actually stand, extend below it, basically. So, in order to actually land this thing, we need to jettison that lower tail fin before we can then deploy the skis and come to a nice, graceful halt in the desert. Anyway, uh, a bit of a tangent there. I was actually talking about the mission profiles of the X-15, wasn't I? So, like I said, there was one kind of mission that aimed to focus on raw speed, which culminated in that record-breaking Mach 6.7 flight. However, I said that there was also another kind of mission that the X-15 flew, and that was trying to get as high up as possible. And it was this mission profile that one pilot, a certain Joseph A. Walker, actually managed to exceed 100 kilometers above the surface of Earth, which is the Kármán line and is the, the point at which space is officially designated to start, which made the man an actual real astronaut. And in fact, he wasn't the only pilot of the X-15 that got to the designation of astronaut. You see, in the 1960s, the US Air Force didn't use the Kármán line to designate where space began, and instead declared that anything above 80 kilometers, as, you know, was in space. I presume they went with 80 kilometers because they used the Imperial system, and 80 kilometers is 50 miles, and 50 miles seems like a nice round number. Though this is me just spitballing right now, and I haven't fact-checked this, so this is just my opinion, man. Uh, don't take citation required here. Anyway, any mad lad who flew something above that 50-mile point was also given the designation of astronaut. So in addition to Joseph A. Walker, two more pilots were considered astronauts in the program. Joe Engel and uh, your boy Neil Armstrong who went on to star in the hit Stanley Kubrick film, The Moon Landing. Sorry, that was a, a terrible joke. I'm so sorry, everyone. Anyway, moving swiftly on, you can see we've actually finished construction of this craft. I've spun it around because I want to aim for the desert, not only because the real X-15 landed in a desert airbase, 
just seemed kind of fitting. And also because, you know, if we were to launch, you know, the normal way as in 90 degrees along the nav ball, uh, we'd end up having to land the X-15 along some rather rocky terrain. It doesn't really work quite as well. We've only got landing skis to land with. So I'm going to launch towards the desert. So we have a slightly flatter area to aim for. There's Jebediah, ready and waiting in his X-15 aircraft as his crewmates Valentina, Bill and Bob all get ready to launch the X-15 itself. And I think I put Matt Kerman in there as well from the Soviet Skylon video just to kind of make up the numbers. Anyway, we could do a nice epic cinematic sort of pan around as we near the end of the runway and we can begin to get ourselves airborne. Now, like I said, I'm going to keep a close eye on our surface velocity there. The maximum speed of the B-52 bomber is about 290 meters per second, so I'm going to try and avoid exceeding that if I can. Uh, just try and, again, make this thing a little bit more realistic, because although I'm using ludicrously overpowered engines that are totally inappropriate for this thing, we they, they allow us to get up a little bit higher. We just have to keep an eye on our throttle, make sure that we don't end up exceeding too high a speed because this thing can quite easily break the sound barrier because it's Kerbal Space Program so of course it can. <laughs> anyway we did have a few cross phase to kind of get to the more interesting part of this mission so we are now at altitude I aimed for 10 kilometers above the surface of Kerbin at which point we started I didn't do a very good job of controlling our flight here I had to maximize the throttle just for a second so our B-52 did exceed 300 meters per second briefly but that was only so we could throttle up the engine on the X-15 here the XLR-99 uh, equivalent rocket engine has now fired up. We deployed it using Action Group 1, I believe I assigned it to, and Jebediah can make his way off into off on his adventure. So I'm going to try and recreate the uh, profile that got Pilot into space because that's, you know, this is Kerbal Space Program, so I felt it was a kind of appropriate thing to try and recreate. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to basically point 45 degrees somewhat aggressively, try and maximize our height because we don't have that much delta V. We're not going to be getting close to any kind of orbit. We're only going to be able to just briefly exit the atmosphere. Do We could do a quick EVA, which the original X-15 couldn't do because that's dumb. <laughs> but this is Kerbal Space Program, so let's do it. Uh, and then we do a quick EVA before re-entering the atmosphere and hopefully landing in the desert. So there's a great shot there. And as we leave the realm of kind of aerodynamic control, you can see we've got those monopropellant thrusters to help keep ourselves on a straight and narrow course because the X-15 actually used uh, RCS thrusters to control itself in the upper atmosphere and indeed in the on the border of space because, you know, in case you guys didn't know this, elevators and things don't work <laughs> when you're that high up. Now, like I said earlier, the X-15 pilots slash astronauts couldn't do EVA, but Jebediah can and he loves space so we can go ahead and do an eva oh i've just noticed that he's flown past the, the nose cone of this craft and i didn't mention something in the build process you may have noticed i clipped a bunch of fuel tanks inside the nose cone of the x-15 which understandably a lot of people think is a bit of a cheaty thing to do however i think it was acceptable in this case because i drained the fuel in that nose cone because you can't just have liquid fuel and oxidizer in it you can only have pure liquid fuel which doesn't help us. So I drained it of all its liquid fuel and then clipped in an equivalent sized uh, combination of liquid fuel and oxidizer. So I hope you forgive that small kind of uh, pro gamer move I did in the uh, vehicle, uh, the space, uh, space plane hangar, I should say. And Jebediah there looking very excited as he re-enters the atmosphere. But this is a somewhat bittersweet re-entry because of course his friends have died a horrible death because unlike in real life, you can't have multiple crafts controlled <laughs> uh, by different crews. In Kerbal Space, you only control one craft at a time. And since I deployed the X-15 in the atmosphere, we had to ditch the aircraft. And it, I guess it just would have ended up crashing into the mountain range, killing all the crew on board. So we'll be doing a quick, quick load once we've landed the X-15. And we'll do a, a little segment of me landing the B-52, which will then, of course, result in the uh, untimely demise of Jebediah. I'm sure Jebediah Kerman is used to uh, fiery deaths in space plane crashes at this point though, so I'm sure he'll be okay. And once all that's done, I'll quick load to before I even started this mission so all my Kerbals will still be alive. This is all a hypothetical social experiment, bro, this video. Anyway, we're getting nice and close to the surface of the desert so we can start killing off the last of all of our high speeds and get ready to initiate the landing procedure, which involves deploying that, that front landing gear, ditching that lower tail fin, and deploying the skis I tried to, but the game decided that it didn't want me to land, 
I guess that was karma for me, murdering the crew of the B-52. Game, I was going to quick load. Uh, and so as a consequence, uh, it crashed. We could just quick load to a different point. And uh, then we can try again. So I decided to, I didn't know if it was, I think I was just getting impatient because I tried a couple of times and the landing skis didn't deploy correctly, even though I tested this craft extensively and they always worked fine. So I guess, I don't know, maybe the game really was just uh, mad at me for murdering my crew. But then I deployed it at above 3,000 meters and for some reason that worked. So I'm, I'll just, I'll just take that. So now we can just coast our way down towards the surface of the desert. We can do some nice epic pan flyby shots to kind of speed up the process for you, the viewer. And then we can get ready to perform our landing itself. Here we go. So we're going to try and find a nice flat spot. And uh, that's it. We're going to try and find a nice flat spot. Keeping our speed as low as possible because we are going to be using those landing skis, which are not very good at, uh, you know, withstanding impacts. Here we go. Maybe, 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 maybe. No, it didn't work. <laughs> it turns out it's really hard to make landing skis in Kerbal Space Program that don't explode. I went back to the drawing board a couple of times to try and experiment with different kind of setups. I couldn't find anything that worked. Aside from just this way where you just have expendable ski beds and then the thing will just skid along on the actual legs that held the skis in place. Just ignore this bit, nothing to see here. This is how I landed, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, my uh, inner perfectionist didn't like the fact I was slightly tipped over. So I used Vessel Mover just to uh, spin us around to the correct orientation for the sake of having a nice kind of finishing pose. I think this is good enough. <laughs> I think it, I feel like this got the message across. Anyway, that's it. that thus concludes the flight of the X-15. Let's just uh, rewind the clock and go back to our initial air launch and see if we can actually recover the B-52 just to confirm that this aircraft also works as intended. So this time when I launched the X-15, I tried not to exceed 290 meters per second and failed, <laughs> granted, but we didn't uh, exceed it by quite so much this time. So I'm going to just take this, you know. I mean, the B-52 could probably do it if it did a dive bomb maneuver, so it... It's, it's fine, let's move on. Uh, in fact, we could probably just skip through a lot of this flight back, flight back to the Kerbal Space Center because it's not the most interesting of flights. Well, at least not as interesting as, I guess, you know, the story of the X-15. Uh, like I say, it remains one of my favorite aircraft from history because it was just so bonkers. Uh, there were a couple of ideas for use of it after the, uh, after the original program ended. One such idea was to make a sequel. The two-seater X-15B, which would not only just briefly graze past the Kármán line, but it would actually enter Earth orbit with the help of a pair of missiles propelling it out of the atmosphere. This idea eventually fizzled out in favour of the Mercury space capsule. However, not wanting to give up on the X-15 cinematic universe, it was proposed that the X-15 could air launch a small rocket into LEO after, you know, it itself was air launched from the B-52 mothership. Just gonna... So the whole yo dog, we heard you liked air launches right now, so you don't, that's not the top comment. But again, it didn't really go very far. But yes, we have now landed. You may have noticed that the landing gear didn't deploy because it's clipped into a cargo bay. So I had to quickly open up the cargo bay doors to lower the landing gear, which meant we started overshooting the runway. So I had to very, very, very quickly use parachutes and full brakes to try and come to a really, really quick stop. Not the best landing, but I guess it's in fitting with the uh, terrible landing of the X-15 itself as well. So... Uh, anyway, here's an end screen moving on. On the left hand side is a link to uh, another video that YouTube suggested to you. On the right hand side is my most recent upload. Links to subscribe and check out Patreon if you would like to. Guys, thank you so much for watching this Kerbal Space Program video. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.